Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's The Cube at IBM Interconnect 2015. Brought to you by headline sponsor, IBM. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are broadcasting live in Las Vegas for IBM Interconnect. This is theCUBE's special presentation from SiliconANGLE. We're on the ground, we're extracting the signal from the noise, and sharing that data with you. I'm John Furrier, my co-host Dave Vellante. Our next guest is Mitch Free, worldwide I2 national security and defense lead at IBM. Um, welcome to theCUBE. What's I2, for the folks who don't know, explain what I2 is, and we're going to talk security. You got the black hat, you got the, the symbol, I mean, Let's get into this. Okay, so uh, I2 is one of IBM's premier uh, products in the uh, Safer Planet organization, which is part of IBM Analytics. And I2's been around for about 25 years. It's an intelligence analysis uh, tool that's been used by 4,500 customers around the world. Anyone from uh, national security, police organizations, the Security and Exchange Commission, anyone that's going after people who are black hats or either on black lists. So any of those nefarious characters that are causing problems on our planet. This is what Safer Planet's all about. We love security, Dave and I. We would probably spend the next the whole day just talking about this topic, but let's just start with uh, some basic stuff going on in the industry. So perimeterless security is now normal in the cloud. The old ways, you know, put the, bar the door, moat, protect, perimeter, all changing. So that we see a lot of new technologies like APIs and notifications and mobile apps opening up lots of doors. There's traditional holes. You have all kinds of stuff. You know, last week the whole Thing was going on with Lenovo. Oh, I've got them. Didn't look for those. That these 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 back doors. So there's a lot of stuff going on from back doors, Trojans to now new ways that apps are accessing databases. So, comment on that trend and where are customers in all this? Because they're like, run, 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 build maps, top line revenue. You know, it's mobile apps. It's all great for the business. But then all of a sudden, wait a minute. There's also a backside to this. What, yeah, about that? absolutely. So if if you look at kind of the customers and they do exactly how you're saying. So. And, it, and it's mandatory, you have to have the moat, you have to have the defenses, you have to have some of the security uh, solutions that are in place now, and as you know, IBM Security Systems has world-class solutions that do that. But what we're seeing in the industry is that now organizations, let's take for instance commercial organizations, they're looking more at who are, who is doing the attacks, why are they doing the attacks, whereas before it was simply I was uh, there was a breach, I need to do damage control, I need to close yeah. the hole, I need to fix this, and then I'll do some remediation after the fact to actually prevent that from the next time. So there was not a lot of focus on attribution, meaning who is actually attacking me, why are they attacking me, are they connected to a wider organization? So if you take, uh, let's say, public safety or government organizations, that's always been their focus. Now the commercial organizations are saying, how do I find out who's attacking me? Well, why? Because they want to start to get ahead. They want to find out their modus operandi. They want to take that and plug it back into their remediation techniques so they can perhaps pick them up faster. So if you look across the board, most of the time when there's a breach, that uh, that breach has been taking place for about eight months. So explain breach and incident. There's two different, <laughs> like so, a breach is like bit bad. Incident is like, less bad than a breach. Well, uh, I think it, certainly a breach would be a form of an incident. Uh, and so there's a lot of incidents that go on. So there's a lot of false positives. I mean, the number of alerts that these security operations centers uh, see every day are just absolutely through the roof and they don't have time to check all of those. So an incident could be something as, uh, you know, someone trying to do a denial of service attack. A breach, as you said, is more serious when they actually get in the door and they're, they're uh, yeah. going around in the background attempting to exfiltrate some sort of data or do some sort of malicious damage inside. And you're saying on average that's eight months before an organization realizes On average we're seeing, uh, yeah, eight months in, and each one of these attacks from a commercial perspective is upwards around $11 million. The, the classic quote is, well, I'm sorry Dave, go ahead. No, oh, go ahead, I'd love to hear this quote. The classic quote we heard on theCUBE, um, the BB quoted is from the, um, from the government. There's two types of companies, those that have been hacked by China and those that don't know they've been hacked by China. <laughs> so, so, and news today, China's dropping Cisco, is some you know, big news out there. It's like, so there's a hacking war going on, and so uh, you, a company could be out there and not even know that there's a super fish going on and there's super fish being a latest exploit yeah. um, going on. So like, okay, I know I'm hacking, I got to deal with that. Now I'm like, wait a minute, do I have something going on? You can't solve all the, you can't 
plug all the holes. What do they do? What do customers so, do with this? So they re you, you can't plug all the holes, and, and I won't necessarily comment on any particular country, but I would say yeah. you, the quote is in fact correct, meaning there are those that uh, have been and those that, that will be hacked. Uh, and it's a question of what's going to happen once they're inside. So what companies are starting to uh, lean towards, as I mentioned earlier, is they're starting to look at attribution. So if you take attribution, I want to find out who's actually behind the attack. Uh, because if I can find out who's behind the attack, it, it's just like tradecraft in a national security organization. I want to know the enemy, I want to know what they're doing, what their weaknesses, what their strong suits are. Then I can start to take some preventative action. So we want to move from being reactive to proactive. So how do we do that? And the challenge is that a lot of people are focused on, as you mentioned, the moat and the defenses. We need to start taking in data other than just the cyber data, so the traditional yeah. IT data. So vendors, including IBM, they're extremely well positioned to take advantage of all of this flow data, all of this data. That's and the bad out. actors are not that, there's not that many of them. I mean, again, it's not like a small amount, but like, there are like known targets, groups of people that work together. We learned that on theCUBE as well. Is that true? Uh, it is true, but let's not forget about the 16-year-old that's sitting in their basement that's trying to hack in. Now, why is that important? From a breach perspective, it may not be that important, but the problem is, once that 16-year-old is in the door and they're actually running amok inside of your system, you don't know that it's a 16-year-old that's just uh, messing about in his garage or his basement. At that point, then companies start to take damage control. They they see that some uh, some breaches let's say happen. some breaches happened, some credit card information has been exfiltrated, and now they go into damage control and they start to notify all of their customers, hey, I've had a breach, when really, in fact, nothing's happening with the 16-year-old. So the, the challenge is, who is your attacker? Is it a 16-year-old, or is it actually organized crime? Is it some anti-money laundering group? Is it someone trying to fund a terrorist organization? That's the challenge, and that's why you're seeing the focus move towards attribution, who's in there. That's going to help me decide what are my next steps in terms of damage control, and it's all going to he also help me on remediation. Mitch, can you talk about uh, the investment, the, f the funding, the spending, it used to all go toward keeping you know, people out of the castle. Um, given that it's eight months on average that people you know, don't realize they've gotten a, a, a breach, how is that investment, how is that spending changing from a customer perspective and how is it changing from IBM's resource allocation? From you know, protecting the queen in her castle with a moat to trying to detect so, I think if you look at that spending now, the, the decision makers, in, in, uh, as you, you've probably heard on the Cube before, the decision makers, uh, it's not only the IT department these mm -hmm. days. Obviously, they have a great influence on, on what's taking place, but it's actually moving up to the boardroom. So the boardrooms are starting to look at this and say, okay, $11 million on average, I need to start dedicating some funding to see how we can start to enforce our current uh, security systems, meaning who's attacking us. So we're starting to see that funding shifting. Obviously, it's like anything else, you have to have the mode in place. After that though, how much are we going to start to dedicate towards the attribution and who's behind the attacks? From the IBM perspective, you can see we've got a lot of investment in IBM security systems, but if you look at Safer Planet and IBM Analytics Group, lots of investment that's going into actually helping take this trade craft from our security policing into the cyber threat intelligence space to actually track down who's doing the attacks. So I realize I'm simplifying it, but if you had $100 to spend as an organization, you know, what, what's the profile look like in terms of just uh, protecting the perimeter versus trying to use things like analytics or other techniques or maybe even internal training to try to uh, uh, remediate you know, some of those problems? Is it 50-50, is it? Uh, no, I, I think you're going to see it move towards 50-50, but it's a long way from that, but it's moved, the, the, the scale is sliding very quickly mm -hmm. now. So I, I'd say at the moment, you're probably talking 75, 75 on traditional security and 25 maybe on uh, on the attribution part. It, I think you're going to see that shift. And it really needs to. To, to which side? Attribution? I think you're going to see that shift towards let's do some cyber threat intelligence because that is really mm -hmm. providing me the ability to be proactive. So I think you're going to see that shift. Look, the, the, the traditional uh, um, cyber security measures, they always have to invest. I don't think you're going to see that shift more than 50-50. Yeah, 50, that's not 50. going away. So yeah, yeah. You're, you're probably going to see a little more movement on that. So that's the ideal balance, let's say, and I know we're really simplifying things here, but what's my question is, what's the, what's the headwind for organizations in making that shift? They obviously have the baseline to keep in place the, the, the perimeter pieces, the traditional pieces. What's slowing them down? 
I'd say it's it's more cultural than it is uh, technical. Like in many, many of these things, when you start to see a shift, people are, are uh, you know, they kind of hang on to the traditional methods. And as they start to see more breaches and they start to see more methodologies come out to help them be proactive, then they start to adopt it. So if you look at the forward-leaning, um, let's say, boardrooms and also the, uh, the security operation centers, uh, you'll start to see them shift. In fact, we, uh, we're hearing this new term quite a bit, the Next Generation Security Operations Center. And in those discussions, you're starting to see this discussion about threat, cyber threat intelligence. I mean, if you look at IBM's X-Force, that's exactly what they provide to our customers. They provide that intelligence on who's out there, what are they doing, and why are they doing it to help them with the remediation. So, next generation security operations centers, you're going to see that activity. So Dave's, Dave's question is a good one. I want to just double down on that for a second, Dave. Customers sitting there, okay, they got the investment pie, they're going to be shifting. What do they do? I mean, how do you get, is there like a getting started kit? Obviously call IBM, you guys will help them along, but how do I get started? How do I train people? I want to hire, do I hire young guns to be like my Navy SEALs of like, of security, I got like the Air Force, I got the Navy SEALs, the Marines. I mean, is it a discipline thing? Is it, how does a company build the culture, hire people, and then like engage you guys? That's a very good question. So in the last week, I've probably had eight conversations on that. And, and it's really companies are asking exactly those questions. I want the next generation security operations center, but it's, it's certainly it's about the technology and the solutions, but it's more about how do I set up these security operations centers? What are the best practices? Uh, where do I need to invest in terms of that training? So, so you mentioned the SEALs, you mentioned all, all of these, uh, kind of these other disciplines <laughs> yeah. uh, in the military. So obviously you got to have your young guns. I mean, let's face it, uh, a lot of the, the younger generation out there, they grew up on this stuff, they're very good at it. But let's not forget the old crows, as we would call them in the military. The, the gentlemen or, or ladies that have been around that have been doing this for years. So now you're seeing a blending of, let's say, older generations, so the young guns and the old crows, and that's really what we see as optimal the old, mix the of old that. The pros are really awesome mentors because they've seen some of the tricks back in the old days, not at the scale. Correct. But as architecturally as an operating yeah. environment. Yeah, so as an example. I mean, do you see that? It's like, it's like. Well, let me just give you one example. Here's a kung fu example. Jeff Frick and I was a you great software. Let, you know. <laughs> let me give you one example of one customer. So uh, we have a customer that has uh, quite a bit of analysts, and uh, they have a lot, a lot of younger generation people in there in the ages, you know, from you know, probably 23 up to 30 years old, but they also have a lot of senior analysts. So one of their requirements was, I need to be able to take my senior analyst who develop a lot of very complex analytics that uncovers insight very quickly, I need to capture that knowledge and put it back into the solution. So that is one of the areas that we've done in the uh, Safer Planet organization with our enterprise insight analysis is we give that customer the opportunity to develop their own analytics for their specific uh, um, use case and then they get to use yeah. it across the enterprise. So there's, an, uh, there's a case where the old crows are able to actually take their expertise and give it put it in the hands of the younger, uh, the younger analysts Jeff, and it really Jeff works Jones good. Jeff Jones has been on theCUBE many times and Dave and I always love to interview him. And one of his uh, comments is, you know, no one writes bomb on a manifest. So it's, it's easy to use <laughs> metadata to look at stuff, but you got to know what the observation space is, that's his word, um, that he uses in terms of IBM. So big data analytics certainly is a huge driver in this, this area, right? So you're not, no one writes, I'm hacking you now, or there's super fish embedded in your machines. <laughs> um, what are you guys doing from a tech standpoint? What, do you, I, what does IBM bring to the table? Because to do that observation space, to expand out the attribution, and to build that next generation security operations center, you need to have the tooling. You absolutely have to have the tooling. So I'm glad you mentioned Jeff Jonas, because Jeff Jonas has been one of our executive sponsors on this particular program, and he's brought a lot of that expertise. In fact, some of his technology is embedded into this solution for exactly that. And you've probably heard Jeff talk about low signals. Yeah. So we yeah. want to pick up the low signals in this massive amount of data. But if you, if you apply this to the cyber threat intelligence space, so typically the, the, uh, the cyber solutions are focused on the IT data. We want to bring in additional data from outside. So we want to bring in your HR records. We want to bring in your physical security. So when I swipe a badge and I go on a door, so now I've got location data, any type of telephone data, that is not collected in the typical system. So we want to merge all of this data together. That presents a problem. How do I get all of that data in? And I want to do- Fast enough, in real time. Absolutely. One of the requirements from our customers was, I want to continuously ingest, and while I'm ingesting, I don't want to do a batch process. I want to be able to do analysis on the data as it's coming in. 
inner Jeff Jonas, his technology is absolutely superb at doing that. New data comes in and it automatically does the identity resolution immediately on the fly 24 seven. You don't have to wait for some sort of batch process. So the key out of that is I need to run analytics across the entire data set. A lot of the uh, other vendors, they will do certain parts at a time or they'll do it in disparate data. You're not going to see these signals or the low signals across individual pieces. You put them together, now you start to see insight. So that's what we're doing to tackle this big data problem. And this, this the market is just, it's infinite. Every year, you know, Art Coviello writes his Warren Buffett letter and every year I email Art and say, Art, I, I'm looking back, I spent more, I worked harder, I'm less secure. And, and I, when I talk to customers, I say, listen, the, it, the calculus is pretty straightforward. It's the probability you know, of, of a breach and uh, the expected loss of that breach. Both are going up. So I feel like there's, yeah. there's no end in sight to the, to the threat, which makes it a great business. Oftentimes you don't like to talk about the business opportunity, but there's a huge business opportunity for security. Spending keeps increasing. It's a Y2K but, problem that never it, goes away. It's a Y2K <laughs> problem that From never From a money goes standpoint, away. I mean, right. this is like... It's the, an arms race, gentlemen. I it mean, really look, is. It, it it's an arms it, race, and as we all know from the, from the Cold War days, that was really, really an economic race. So how do you stay ahead of the adversary? And that's really what we're What's talking about. What's the badass, about. baddest ass thing you've seen on security in terms of like threat, like that you can speak about? The, the superfish is one that's been this week. It's the, it's the, it, that's pretty significant. That snuck in off. But what's the what's the heaviest thing that you've seen that blew I think your the mind? He, I think the heaviest thing that you see is things that may or may not make it to the press in terms of how the breach occurred. Mm. So Stuff if, we don't see. So if, if you <laughs> if you look at one that was recently in the news where uh, you think that the attack came full frontal right in through the front door or right in through a very well published back door. In fact, it happened from, uh, let's say, an ancillary type of website that was remotely connected with the organization that was there for a charitable organization type of way for the company to give back to the community. Well, the infiltrators got in and they studied for six months, they studied the security architecture of that um, kind of smaller website yeah. that really the was not connected. It's the beast out in the jungle and they just took it down and bit well, base camp So what they did is they studied the security architecture and then they discovered that the same person, so these are smart characters, they actually did their intelligence on their target. They determined that the person that set up the security on that very small system set up the security on the large major system. So they reverse system. engineered the security for the main system based upon Bingo. the prototype that they saw the, the quote, I got to get this done over the weekend for the charitable organization. So he took his, they, they basically went, read his mind. Exactly, they read his mind, they tested all of their techniques, and then they moved it in for the big kill. That is the most dangerous. So you think something yeah. is quite benign, but really it's anything but benign. And the so, motivation there was, was dollars, it was money? Absolutely, in yeah, this particular so, case, it's exfiltration of customer data, dollars, and it yeah. was, it was in the double digit billions. So, your point about it's double digit billions. It's correct. It's, it, you, it's your point about it, it's an economics arms race is it right is. on, and the bad yeah. guys have a lot of resources. <laughs> and, uh, and, it's, um, and then the other vector that I want to explore, I feel like Stuxnet just sort of created a whole new era of <laughs> security and, 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 and ideas on <laughs> what's possible, the future of warfare. Is that. Sort of, a, is that a milestone in the security business? Um, is it sort of? I know it's old news now, but I, I wonder what else is out there that's Stuxnet like that we don't know about. It's got to be, you know, in this arms race. Sort of a, you know, what era are we in here? Well, if if you think about it, um, they only have to be lucky once. Yeah. And, and they can do, you know, millions and millions of attacks, and they only have to be lucky once. They have plenty of time. They're able to try out new techniques, and they're always 24/7 working on those new techniques. So the question is, you know, to, to go after your question, how do we stay ahead of that? Because it's constantly changing. You gotta rethink, you gotta rethink a new way to think through security, to use their phrase for IBM. And that, that is exactly it. It's a one shot deal. There could be a zillion attempts and just one penetrates. But but the but the question is, if it costs double digit billions, it's not a money issue because you know the sales, hey what are some of the consequences if you don't do this? You know, there's no no, there's like billions, so the money on the table is there. So if that's the case, how does IBM write the software there and and what do you do with customers? Do they say, okay, just hand over money? Do, is it cryptography? Is it System Z? I mean, System Z has some serious cryptography. Is that the answer? Um, well, so like, 
Well, I mean, look, we can throw a, a smorgasbord of technology at this. So our, our approach is we want to be very systematic. So when people come to us, they want to know about next generation SOC. Yeah. So we have a consulting practice that actually does this. We also have the IBM Security Systems that has a whole host of tools that actually fits in with that consultancy. On the Safer Planet side of the house, where we use our I2 counter fraud and, and threat solutions, we're looking at being able to establish a platform that's very flexible and very agile. And that comes directly from our national security experience mm -hmm. because the mission is changing. And think about that and carry it over to the commercial space. The mission is changing. I need to have a technical solution that gives me the agility to change as the threat changes and it gives me the flexibility to be able to add in those models as we need. So if you look at what we're doing, we tackled the big data, the identity resolution from Jeff Jonas. We tackled all of those first for initial customer. Now we went to the next step. How do we use Watson Discovery Advisor? How do we use uh, Watson Explorer to do unstructured data? As you well know, the unstructured data is 70-80% of the data that's coming in. So the key to that is agility and flexibility and be able to do uh, analytics at speed and scale across that entire data set. That's what we put in place, it gives them the most flexibility. And you talked about sort of the national defense trickling into the commercial world, but to me that, that stakes of the national defense, I mean, it's they're huge. And we're talking about, again, the future of, of warfare here. So are those two related? In other words, are we sort of learning from what we're doing in the governments? Does that, does that actually trickle down into business? Does it trickle down fast enough? So I think what you're seeing is the, the nexus of, let's say, national security and even geo uh, geopolitics with the commercial world. So as you know, there are state actors that are attacking some of uh, the commercial organizations around the world. Right. So it's no longer the 16-year-old or let's say an anti-money laundering organization. Of course, they're, they're a threat as well, but now the state actors start to come into place. So the nexus of those entities, and it's, it's an asymmetrical threat. If you think about a commercial organization compared to a state actor, there's a lot at stake there, and it's a very difficult situation. Now, what comes to the table is not only the IBM solutions, but you're seeing the commercial organizations start to cooperate with the government defense. It's a partnership. So now you're going to start to see a lot of sharing of cyber threat intelligence data, and that's why we think that going to being able to determine who's the threat and why are they there, that's going to become more of a factor in, in defenses for commercial organizations. And, and, and how about the way IBM works with competitors? I mean, you, yeah, you compete, guys compete head to head, but you're the good guys, HP's the good guys, RSA's the good guys, yep. Symantec's the good guys. How much collaboration is going on at the, at the, within the competitive? Landscape? So I think you see from uh, the professional organizations, IBM does a lot of work in these professional organizations, the, the X-Force, uh, reports that go out are uh, consumed by people around the world. I mean, some of our competitors, and and they uh, actually collaborate on that. So on the professional organization side, IBM uh, participates in quite a bit of those on the national defense side, as well on the, as on the commercial side. So I think at that level, you're seeing quite a bit of cooperation. But I mean, like, again, let's face it, this is business, and uh, and we want to promote our business. <laughs> so talk about developer community. Obviously, this is a big developer show, kind of show. It's not filled as a developer mm -hmm. show. Um, What's your take on developers? Are there great resources out now? Is Watson a good thing to play with? And, and are security developers nuanced on certain things? And do they like certain tools? What's your view of how a developer building out the next generation security operations center will look like? What tooling? So, so that's a good question, and, and I don't think I don't think we're seeing a uh, comprehensive approach across your your entire question. But what we are seeing is quite a bit of interest on the developer side in the shall we say the open source. So, if you're familiar with GitHub, sure. how you do open source development. So, uh, the the Safer Planet organization actually has a GitHub site where we. Uh, we place things out in open source like connectors because the key to all of this is getting the data in. So we have uh, uh, developers on the open source side around the world that are actually developing um, uh, plugins to our tool and they're also developing connectors and they're all made available on GitHub. So we're, we are a strong supporter, IBM in general is a strong supporter on open source as you know, but also Safer Planet organization is directly contributing to the open source and it's mainly around the uh, um, I2 intelligence analysis that can be applied across the spectrum. Obviously, that can be applied to cyber threat intelligence as well. 
I mean, if I was a young kid, I was a computer science major, I would love to go to the security. I think it's one of the most intoxicating, technical, fun. I mean, if you're a gamer, you got to love security. Absolutely. I mean, you must get a lot of gamers who come in saying, I mean, because it's like first person shooter is security. You have to go at, look at the landscape, look at the targets, understand some of the attributal things. Uh, are you seeing that? I mean, is that kind of the profile well, developers? If you look at kind of our profile of the people that are that are on our team, you play Call of Duty, or you could work in security. So <laughs> if you look at the profile, we have, we have quite a bit of uh, the younger generation. But if you look at the the people that are on our team, we have uh, former uh, military analysts, we have former security operations center cyber threat analysts, we have police officers, former police officers. Uh, and, and I think they think that they're in the most exciting part of IBM yeah. because of exactly what you said. The other point I, I might add to that is when we get up and come to work, we know that we're trying to make a safer planet. So that's, you know, that's, uh, maybe that's a little bit of a lofty idea, but when you come to work and you know that you're yeah. going after bad guys and you're helping customers and governments go after bad guys, that's pretty fulfilling. Yeah, it's interesting, I mentioned on the yeah, intro, right. and I'll just end the segment with this, get your comment on it. It's like. They have two ends of the spectrum. There's good guys and bad guys. And uh, this startup that we know in California called Mintigo, started by a bunch of big data math guys uh, in Israel, and they did all the intelligence to, to find the bad guys. So I asked them, why did you start this social sales company? He goes, well, we were sitting at a cafe one time. We said, we're so good at finding the bad guys. Why don't we find the good guys? And so essentially, you know, if you look at IBM Watson, you know, the talk here is, oh, you know, social business, you know, it's the reverse on the other side. Find the good guys find the target customers, you know, that's a big data problem. We actually have uh, a couple of uh, good guys, bad guys, couple okay. customers that are looking for good guys. One of them is uh, from, executive, um, uh, from executive security, and another one is if you're trying to lobby, let's say, something in Congress or whatever, who are the people that's on your side and how can I leverage them? So yeah. it's exactly the how same trade craft. How to serve customers, the good guys, how to serve good, the good guys, and get the bad guys. <laughs> exactly. Awesome, well, good guys and bad guys are out there. Big data, cloud scale, new ways, new architectural security centers. Uh, super fun area, you must love your job. I do, absolutely, <laughs> thank you very much. We are here live at IBM, we'll be right back after this short break, just talking security, having some fun. We'll be right back, day three of theCUBE, we'll be right back.